Yeah, I didn't watch the first uh, eight innings. Watch the uh, the ninth and the tenth, and I feel like I watched the four hour game. But uh, Mets pulled out one. They they definitely needed. And I'll tell you what, I didn't see the uh, call at home plate. I was listening in the car. Uh, but I'll tell you, the umpiring from what it sounds like and from what I've seen. Uh, it, look, the umpiring in this league has been an embarrassment for 15 years. I could go back and tell you stories of things I remember uh, 15 years ago. I don't know what it is. They've gotten fired already once for their behavior, but it just uh, I, I just don't understand sometimes the strike zone. I don't understand how they could blow certain calls. And, uh, you, know, you know, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Mike. Is this the worst you've seen this year? I've heard a lot of people say that. I know. My, listen, my father's watched baseball for over 40 years. He says this is the worst he's ever seen. Do you agree with that? Well, I'll go even back to the playoffs last year. I mean, going back to the Yankee-Minnesota series, how they blew that fair ball. Yeah, it's pretty bad. And, um, I, you know, it really comes down to the strike zone. I think I've always had issues with the strike zone. And I even went back, and I remember I was watching. I think it was, I'm going to say 1992-93. Maybe it was a Pirate Brave classic playoff game. And I was looking at the strike zone from back then, and clearly back then it was wider. I mean, we used to talk about Maddox and Glavin and getting that corner. No doubt about it. That's changed now. Uh, and sometimes it's just it's just like a postage stamp up there. And I thought Whiteside was out on the uh, 2-2 pitch. That was close, but you didn't expect uh, Rodriguez to get that call, and then obviously he swung through the curveball. But, um, yeah, I mean, your dad is probably on to something. It's pretty bad. And I guess I wish I could, I wish I could tell you why. I don't know. I don't know if it's. Uh, positioning, arrogance, um, the game is maybe too fast for them. That's a possibility, you know. It's, it's a lot of different things. All right, well, now now that we can kind of get over the game here after that heart attack almost, let's talk about the mix, this road trip. Now, listen, we knew this was a very big road trip for the team. A lot of people are saying this can make or break their season depending on, you know, what they do. Well, one, they lost three out of four games. <laughs> you know, the starting pitching, like, was great. This, this whole series, and, and it's funny because the offense is what went dead. What do you, I mean, we've talked about this for half the season already. What do you attribute to their struggles on the road? Is it, it, I mean, are they just that comfortable, more comfortable getting that last at bat playing in City Field? Or are the pitchers more comfortable at home? What do you make of this? Uh, you know, I'll, I'll put a couple of things. First, I think on a nightly basis, the guy in the dugout is the weak link. I haven't been impressed with Jerry's managing now. Let me be clear, Jerry's done a great job in the clubhouse. Uh, Wright has helped him a lot with that. Uh, they haven't laid down for him like they did a year ago. There was a point in time which I wondered if they were going to play for him anymore in, in late April and then again in late May. So he's done a good job on that end, and he's kept these guys behind him. I think they enjoy playing for him, and I don't think that they lose because of a lack of effort. But from the standpoint of bullpen management, the bullpen has been a disappointment this year. Jerry hasn't really established roles. Uh, albeit he's been dealt with some subpar relievers at times throughout the year, but he was the one that drove Fernando Nieve into the ground. He's the one that a couple of days after saying that Bobby Parnell would not go more than one inning, he pitches him into a second inning in San Juan. Uh, he's the guy that uh, K-Rod has had issues about his utilization. Uh, he's seen Elmer Descends come into games, which you, you wonder why he should be in there, and then Pedro Feliciano seems to pitch every night. I think that's probably a big part of their road struggles uh, right off the bat. Um, is it a comfort level? Yeah, maybe they feel a little bit more comfortable at City Field. But when it comes down to it, I think bullpens uh, in most of these games win, and the Mets bullpen is mismanaged. It's, it's not effective at times, and it's probably sure if they need another uh, strikeout uh, guy who misses bats, you know, like a Dotel type maybe for the eighth inning. And they probably need a second lefty. The second lefty I think they should have had in the offseason. I don't know why they passed up signing one of the, uh, the three guys I always point out, Ron Mahay, uh, Will Ullman, and Joe Bima. I think any of those three would have been great. Uh, to compliment Feliciano may even be, been better than Feliciano. Um, and I think that really comes down to what a lot of their struggles. I don't know the number, but they've lost 10 games in, in the final at bat. Obviously, those are all on the road, but I'd love to see how many of those games they were ahead and what the situation was. And, and obviously, this could have been number 11 today. Uh, hey, Mike, uh, Steve here. I'm on the sub subject of acquisition, acquisitions, uh, we're about three weeks away from the trade deadline. Uh, it doesn't seem like the Mets need a bat. Maybe a second baseman, as we talked about earlier. Uh, they couldn't use help in the bullpen, uh, like you said, as far as the staff. Uh, the staff being six uh, in all of baseball and team ELA, it appears an ace would really help this team with, with some uncertainty, uh, maybe after Santana. But 
What do you think the team is going to do as far as Little is concerned? I don't think they're going to do anything. I have to tell you, I just get the gut feeling that the price for some of the pitchers like Lily, I mean, off the bat, we're hearing, and, and this is pretty good information, this isn't just pie in the sky, that you know, they were scouting names like Robert Carson and Kyle Allen and Juris Familia for Ted Lilly, who has a suspect shoulder, um, is going to be a free agent, yeah, he'll be a type A, but if you offer him arbitration, you run into the, fa- uh, the, the problem of whether he accepts it or not, so that's not a shoe in that the Mets will get the draft picks. Uh, you know, Brett Myers, Royals Walt, and even Danny Haran, or Har- Har- they're going to be expensive. I think Myers, and that's why I wrote today, and I know Mets fans don't want to hear this, Myers, if the price comes down prospect-wise, I think makes the most sense because uh, on two fronts, he's making $8 million next year. Uh, he doesn't cost you as much in terms of prospects. And you have that veteran 3-4 starter that really they needed this year. I mean, they could have had a John Garland or a Ben Sheets or a Joel Pinero. I think for relatively uh, inexpensive contracts, again, it's not my money, it's the Wilton's money, and they're fortunate that Takahashi and, most, more importantly, Dickey have been able to overcome the lack of that uh, veteran fourth starter because, I mean, think about if Dickey has not pitched the way he has, his team would be a second-division club right now. And, and I think that right now that was probably what they need. They need another arm, and then that would probably the starting pitcher solve two things. It would have... Takahashi moved back into the bullpen where I think he'd be a farm setup man and he'd be able to get somebody. And that's why I think Myers is the guy I would do because it would kill two birds with one stone this year and next year. And then you don't have to get into the Bronson Arroyo, Ted Lilly, uh, Javier Vasquez bidding war because I don't know if this the Mets want to go and give out another four-year contract to a pitcher that we just don't know what he's going to give you year to year. And um, it's not that I believe the Wilpons are broke. I just think they're going to be a little bit more fiscally responsible. And I think the commissioner's office wants teams to be fiscally responsible, and that's not necessarily how you win a bidding war for any of those guys. <laughs> very good point. Very good point. Um, get to the uh, real quick. Go off subject just for a second. Get to the catching situation. Now we know Rod Barajas has been killing us at the plate lately. Uh, he started off great, had those 11 home runs early on, and has just completely died off. Uh, Henry Blanco, you know what he is basically. He's an older veteran guy. He's going to give you some games. Josh Solis looked good, uh, but it looks as if he's going to sp- uh, catch Dickey in Arizona, and the room is he's going to go down. Uh, what do you make of that? I mean, do you, would you leave Solis up and just let him be your starting catcher? How, how do you figure that? Well, you got two veterans, and unless you're going to trade one of these two guys, either Blanco or Barajas, they probably are here to play for this year. I think if Tolley, his value is going to be catching Dickey, and I, sometimes I was thinking actually the other day that since Dickey came to the team is when Barajas' production has gone down. I wonder in some weird way if that's connected. <laughs> can't prove it, I mean, but Barajas and Bo Blanco have talked about how difficult it is to catch R.A. Dickey and how they stress about it. And it sounds like Tony doesn't have that same stress level when he's catching the knuckleballer. Um, I think he needs to play every day. He's not going to play every day here. Uh, I'm not quite sure if I'm sold on Josh Tolley for a couple of reasons. He's a single hitter. He would round out a lineup very nicely. He's a nice number two hitter. He gives me a little feeling of like a left-handed Paul Laduca. But I have noticed when he's caught, I don't know if you guys have, the running game for the opposition has been a lot more of a factor than it is um, when he hasn't caught. And it hasn't, I necessarily think, burnt the Mets to the point where you could say, well, that's why they lost the ball game. But I do feel that even when Barajas and Blanco don't catch, uh, when Barajas and Blanco catch, well, they don't throw someone out, I should say, is what I'm, what, I'm, what I'm getting to here. The running game is stopped, and the running game isn't a factor. And when they don't hit, I'm okay behind the plate sacrificing that. And, and I think people pointing to their offensive deficiencies are quite simply not focusing on what the real offensive issue is, which is left field with Bay as a singles hitter, and right field where Frank Corr, until Beltran has come back, has been an utter disappointment. Um, and I think Blanco and Barajas get kind of lumped into there. But I will sacrifice offense behind the plate. And if you look across the league, outside of the, the Mowers of the world, the really top, you know, Buster Posey, top-hitting catchers, everybody's catching situation is in a similar p- position. And that's where the defense, to me, is the, is the difference. That's why I don't want a Greg Zone behind the plate. You know, everyone could cite war and all this other advanced metrics. It's nonsense. You need, you need defense and game calling behind the plate. And I, and I think both of those guys hit enough for you to justify their inclusion in the lineup. The difference is that they become more of a focus because of the lack of offense at second, 